Right, we're going to pick up the story where we left off last time. Having covered something of the history of cognitive science, with forays into philosophy of mind and the history of psychology, we turned our attention to language. We wrapped that up and we started on the large topic of learning and development. As with all topics within this module, we'll be coming at this from a wide variety of perspectives. Uh, in order to shine as many different lights from as many different angles as possible. We started the last day with a discussion of the distinction between altricial and precocial animals. Altricial animals being in particular those that are helpless at birth and therefore dependent upon a period of intense parental care. Occupies a lot of resources, takes a lot of time. Um, this has nothing to do with whether something is intelligent or not or human-like or not. Um, but what it does do is it, uh, it allows us to relate the developing organism to the ecological niche in which it's born. Those animals that have the luxury of um, extended period of parental care can accommodate and fine-tune their development to suit the environment into which they're born. This accounts in some respects for the great range of altricial animals because they have this ability to morph into a form suited to a given environment because of this period after birth, but before they can take care of themselves, in which they can be sensitively influenced. And we know that for humans, this alerts us to the fact that we have an extremely long period of parental dependence, and um, even biological development, the frontal lobes are developing in all that time, up for 21 years or so. And this is... Uh, reflected in the manner in which we fit into our environment, which for humans is not primarily a physical environment. Our, the most important elements in our environment are always other humans. And so this long period is the period of acculturation in which we become members of one kind of society or another kind of society. We often like to think of humans as one kind of thing, but we're a very, very diverse species. And you're born not in, people are born not only into different physical environments, but are born into radically different cultures, and they become very different kinds of people. We'll be coming back to this notion uh, later on today. But today, we're going to start off by looking at two landmark figures in developmental psychology, two landmark figures who have addressed the changes that happen from birth up until about the age 14 or 15 or so. This is a period of, of course, rapid development and change um, in humans. The two figures we're going to look at stand out. They, um, they were born in the same year, 1896, Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky. They were born in the same year. They were aware of each other's work. And they come at development from completely different perspectives. And every year when the topic of development comes up, on an exam paper, I get people discussing them as if they were opponents, as if they were opposing football teams, and one of them has to be right. Please, that's not the case. They had the greatest respect for each other's work. They did interact with each other. They are not opponents, but they do illustrate very different aspects of human development, and it's important to appreciate both. We need to situate this a little bit in a historical context. Although they were born in the same year, 1896, they were born in different places, and Vygotsky unfortunately died young. He died before he hit age 40. He died in 1934. But he was a Russian. And so he experienced the Russian Revolution and the birth of communism in the Soviet Union, a strongly collective society, and that greatly influenced his work. Furthermore, because he published mostly in Russian, and because of the subsequent development strained relationships between Russia and the West, uh, his work was not translated into English until considerably after his death and only became widely known to things like educational psychologists who really need to know his work in the 1970s, 1980s. So there's been a bit of catch-up. Whereas Piaget was a Frenchman who was working mainly in Paris and his work was very influential from the 1950s. He was very much part of the cognitivist turn around the middle of the 20th century in which we've seen so often we've seen this adoption of the computer metaphor, the idea that m m what it is to think is similar to running a computer program, that thought has to do with symbol manipulation. Piaget is in there, he's part of this development, although he makes a very idiosyncratic and personal contribution to it. 
So his work was immediately influential in a way that Vygotsky's, at least in this part of the world, wasn't, but is increasingly. In keeping with this different historical perspective, they emphasize different aspects. Piaget emphasizes the processes of development and change, maturation, we'll call it, within an individual. So he's looking very much at an isolated individual as they go from being helpless to being competent, as they go from being an infant to being an abstract reasoner. Um, his emphasis is on biological sequencing. And one way to think of this is, if I were to give you a sunflower seed, and I was to say, here, make some more sunflower seeds with this, will you please? What you would do is you'd go and you plant it in a pot, and then the seed would germinate, and then it would grow, and it would grow up to a certain height, and then it would flower, and then there would be more seeds made. And there's no way to circumvent that process. You can't skip the germination stage. You can't skip the flowering stage. If you want to get from here to there, there's a certain sequence of stages you just have to go through. Now, for any individual plant, the conditions under which those stages are manifested will vary. Some plants will have more water, some will have less water, the soils will vary. This influences the development, but it doesn't change the basic fact that in a sunflower's life there are certain there's a sequence of steps that have to be gone through in order to live that life. That's Piaget's focus. Vygotsky, coming as he is from this nascent communist society, is emphasizing the collective aspects to our nature, so not an isolated individual considered in, uh, without reference to context, but looking at how a child develops within a particular society, within a culture, as a product of a whole suite of interpersonal relationships. So very much looking at the ties between the individual and the society, the people around it and the culture around it. So we'll see a, uh, the absence of any clear boundaries between the psychological, the social and the cultural when we turn to Vygotsky's work, whereas Piaget is looking at psychological development of a child from a biological point of view. So we'll start with Piaget. Given that what I've just said about his focus, he's interested in the changes that predictably occur within a child and what the sequencing of them is. He's particularly interested in those changes that don't admit of reordering. There is some day in your life you'll learn something, you learn how to use a yo-yo, for example. I don't know whether you learned to use a yo-yo when you were six, or whether you maybe still haven't had the pleasure of learning to use a yo-yo, in which case you could pick it up now. That's not the kind of thing that Piaget is interested in, because that's not tied to any particular developmental sequence. I presume there's a minimum age below which you're never going to learn to use a yo-yo, but as far as I know, you can learn to use a yo-yo any time thereafter. However, acquiring language is a very different kettle of fish. Young children acquire language absolutely easily, effortlessly, and later on you know yourself at your stage it's kind of difficult to pick up another one. Something happened there. You were changed by that first acquisition of language that made it difficult, among other things, to pick up another language. So this business of sequencing and timing is very important to him. And Piaget's emphasis, given that he's looking at the child as an, as an autonomous individual, He's emphasizing various rationalist concerns. But I want to avoid, again, simplistic dichotomies. We'll be coming back to this again and again today. He's interested in the progression from a rich physical sensory motor embedding of the child in its environment, which describes the situation of the infant, very much living in the here and now, occupied with the things that can be touched, mouthed, um, and so on, to a stage at about 14 or 15 where the child is capable of complex abstract thought. So this is kind of a Cartesian perspective. The end state is seen as mastery of what Descartes called the mind's proper objects, logic and reason. And the stages that have to be passed through to get there, well, they don't come with big flagpoles and, and, and clear borders between them. Piaget outlined four stages, which we'll run through. The sensory motor stage from zero to two. Here there is a kind of a clear border, because that's the pre-linguistic stage. This is an infant who doesn't have language. And then you acquire language, and that changes the game. We enter what we call the pre-operational stage up to about age seven. And around about age seven, there are significant changes to the child's abilities um, that merit identification of what he calls the concrete operational stage. 
less clear to me what the difference of where the borders are here between the concrete operational stage and the formal operational stage. But this particular border is well marked in very many societies with the transition from primary school, which is a particular kind of learning environment, to secondary school, which is a radically different kind of learning environment. So we might reflect on that a little bit. As the child is going through all these stages, having new experiences, the child is, of course, changed by these new experiences all the time. And one thing Piaget is interested in is which changes are relatively trivial, which changes can be accommodated um, or uh, uh, can you adapt to without really influencing your inner cognitive economy much. So suppose one day you go down to the shop and you find there's a new flavor of ice pop. My God, the world is a different place now. There's a whole new flavor of ice pop. Okay, but it's, you know, it's a limited kind of change. You're a change as a result of the fact that there's now a new flavor of ice pop, but it's not a huge change. Whereas when you acquire language, that changes you. That's a really big change. It changes the way that you think and so on. So they're both processes of adaptation. You're adapting in both cases to new experiences. And Piaget distinguishes between assimilation, where your novel experience can be more or less dealt with given what you've learned and experienced and mastered so far. So this is an incorporation into the existing structures of thought. And the new ice pop flavor fits in here. It's not going to change the way that you think about the world, even though it's hugely significant. Whereas acquiring language changes your whole cognitive economy, it changes the way that you think, the abilities that you have. That's the process of accommodation, where the new, this new experience of becoming a symbol user, for example, changes the way that you, thought, you think, it changes your mental structure, it changes your inner cognitive world. So these are two different uh, things to be considered when we look at the experiences a child has and how the child is changed by them. Some changes are more profound than others, to put it bluntly. We we'll start with this sensory motor stage, which is the first approximately two years, that is up until language, the appearance of language. In girls, this language tends to appear a little bit earlier than it does in boys, so this could be anywhere between one and two years. But importantly, the child doesn't have language, and they interact with their environment through their physical actions. First of all, with the mouth. The mouth is extremely important in exploring the early infant environment. And then with their hands and body. But the emphasis is always on that which is here and now, that which the child is in physical contact with. Um, so living very much in the moment, as it were, much like an animal does, I suppose. There's an interesting factor about kids at this age, which is that they don't have object persistence. When something comes into view, oh, look, there's a truck. It goes out of view. They have no sense that the truck still has an independent existence, that the truck still exists and could be expected to reappear. So you can't do magic tricks on a child at this age. You can play peekaboo, though, which is toying with their... Um, the sense of object persistence, I'm gone, I'm back, I'm gone, I'm back, gets a bit old after a certain age, but kids at this age love it for precisely this reason, because it's always surprising when someone comes back. <laughs> they don't have this sense of something persisting. And with this, you can see, when we identify something like object persistence, it's not difficult to develop a formal standardized test for object persistence. You know, it's like doing a little magic trick. You put something behind a, a, a screen, and then you make it disappear. And then you open the screen and see if the child surprised or not. If they're surprised, then they had the expectation that something was going to be there. So they have mastered object persistence. And this is a landmark, and you can develop standardized tests in order to establish whether that landmark has been passed. And now you're in the business of developing educational curricula, defining what's normal in development, defining what's not normal, who's got learning disabilities, all this business of standardized educational testing is based on Piaget's approach to theory. Once you identify late the territory out like this, you can develop these standardized tests that bring into being a kind of a norm. So there's a political angle to this as well. Right. These are simple beings. Once they get language, then things really take off. Now, you don't acquire language all in one go. You first learn to use words, individual words, to name things. And we've seen in the example of Sheba and um, Sheba and what was it, Sarah, the chimpanzees, we've seen um, 
how simply having a, at your disposal, having symbols at your disposal, gives you the ability to solve problems that you couldn't solve before. So merely the use of symbols is a significant milestone that changes your cognitive economy, if you like. At this early stage, up to about age seven, the child's reasoning is, we call it fanciful and wishful. It's not grounded in any kind of reality. They don't have an understanding of geopolitical realities, of the processes of history and so on. They make it all up, frankly. <laughs> so what they can reason about is stuff that's physically present, that's immediately present. Right? Going beyond that is challenging, and it's, it's great fun, but it's not particularly grounded. Anyone who's had the experience of dealing with kids in this age bracket knows that their understanding of time is very limited. They know they're going to go to sleep, but that's it. Tomorrow is an uncharted wasteland. And when it's coming up to Christmas, you have to go five sleeps till Christmas, four sleeps till Christmas, three sleeps till Christmas, in order to give them a framework for their expectations. They don't do time very well. So then somewhere around here, around age seven, we start to see the beginnings of abstract reasoning and thinking. Language use is now much more sophisticated, of course, and that provides some structure with which you can think. Think back to Jerry Fodor and the role of mentalese in structuring abstract complex thoughts. Reasoning is supported by practical physical aids in many respects. So here I've illustrated the child with the truck. Previously, we saw the child playing with an individual truck, making no truck noises. But here the child knows that this truck is one of a class of trucks and it's related to real fire trucks that are in real fire stations. And there could be red trucks and yellow trucks and blue trucks. So this is a kind of an abstraction that goes beyond what's present in the here and now. The border between this stage and the next stage is to me very fuzzy, but it's nice to think of it if you can remember the challenges that secondary school brought to you you're switched from a very, very different learn kind of learning environment. In primary school, we have a single teacher who takes care of you all day. In secondary school, you're going to this class, you're going to this class, your teachers are changing all the time, you're becoming responsible for a lot of stuff. The demands are much greater, and you're required to be able to engage in a lot of abstract reasoning. It's introduced gradually, but the idea, and this is kind of a point that Descartes would, would like, hopefully by age 14 or 15, the mind is now capable of and uh, dealing with what Descartes called its proper objects, logic and reason. So you can see Piaget's focus here is on the emergence of a particular kind of reasoning intellect from a grounding in the physical here and now from sensory motor engagement in the world to the point at which you can be capable of doing such masterful feats as doing mathematics. That's Piaget. And it's a very, very interesting approach to human development. It's a very important one, and it's the basis for most standardized psychological testing, uh, certainly in the educational sphere. And when we come to Vygotsky, with his emphasis on society and culture, we see something very, very different. We see different aspects, not in competition. We see a whole different side to our being. Vygotsky, given his historical background, is going to emphasize that all learning is done in a social context. You learn in the presence of others, you learn with the assistance of others, and you learn in interaction with others. And the others can be peers, like here, or they can be caregivers, like here. There's no requirements that they, they be particularly qualified, but we learn in the company of others. And the kind of skills and capacities for thought and for problem solving and reasoning that we develop um, first appear not in an inside your mind, not in some hidden interior space. They appear publicly between people. So language is a good example. Language is, appears as something that goes on between people, and it's only later that it becomes internalized and available to you for silent internal thought. That's a necessary sequencing. It happens first in public. Another way to think of this, remember you're learning your, your times tables in school. You sat in a room and you chanted, three times three is nine, three times four is twelve. And this was all done in a public sphere. None of, no kids at that stage could do this in their heads. But what you're doing is you're providing the means for, for internalization. We do it first in public and we do it together. And then it becomes something that you can take away and master on your own. So Vygotsky is very interested in this progression from something that happens between people to something that becomes internalized. 
And it's a very important concept. He gave it a fancy name, the zone of proximal development. And the basic idea is this. At any given stage, a child has a certain set of abilities and stuff that they can do on their own, but put them in company and they can do a lot more. So I've called that, you can do, if you can do X on your own, you can do X plus Y when you're together with your peers or together with your teacher. In that case, these skills that are available in interaction belong to this zone of proximal development, and those skills will become the kind of thing that the child might internalize and later be able to do on his own. This never stops. This is not a matter of fixed sequencing. To this day, you learn together with people, and you then internalize things. Skills are first manifested in a public uh, interpersonal arena, and then they become available for incorporation, for internalization. It's a very, very important insight as to where all those abilities that you seem to consider your own, where they came from. There is consequences for this for educators, just as there was from Piaget's work. If, from a Vygotskyan perspective, our uh, practices around here of examination are a disaster, an unmitigated disaster. We're taking people out of their normal environment, which is in interaction with other people, making free use of all kinds of tools and resources, and we shut them off from that, we make them do exams where they're not allowed to talk to other people, closed book, no internet, no access to all the things that you normally use to think with. And we judge you on that basis. I apologize in advance. I'm required to give you exams. I don't regard them as any good measure of you or your abilities. Um, so I'm not judging you when we do exams. We're required to do some, say, some sort of exams. In general, for educators, when dealing with children, you should never, you should not only look at what they have mastered on their own, but look at them in company. Look at what a child can do and what's in that zone of proximal development, what we can expect the child to master over the next while. Another consequence of Vygotsky's very different perspective on learning and development is to look at how meaning is socially constructed, look at how culture comes to become part of our lives, become part of our worlds, so the very things around us, a dreidel there is a toy which if you grew up in Jewish culture you probably would have played with, and if you didn't you probably never played with. A fork is similarly a cultural object. We take forks to just be there, but no, of course if you travel enough around the world you realize that there are places that don't use forks, and so the fork is very much something that's come into being among a certain group of people in their interactions. A birthday cake, even something as rudimentary as a chair or a door has cultural significance and is what it is by virtue of the interactions among a bunch of people um, over time. So as we internalize the meaning, so our world comes to be saturated with these cultural significances, a sense of meaning um, and import that doesn't arise from thinking, but arises from um, interpersonal interactions from a whole bunch of people. The Vygotskyan perspective shows us something very different about language and thought. The relationship of language and thought, of course, we've seen as a very important concern for cognitive psychology. Vygotsky noted correctly, I think, that kids, very young kids, think out loud. When they first learn language, they don't have a division between an inside reflective quiet voice and an outside communicative voice. That distinction between thought and communication is not there for the early language users. They think literally out loud, and they have to be told, little Billy is told in church, use your inside voice, Billy. You have to learn to inhibit the production of sound. So this is a very clear example of something appearing first in an external, intersubjective arena, and only later becoming internalized. And you may remember we mentioned the role of joint attention in early language learning when we were discussing that small biological change that happens sometime between the last common ancestor of the apes and of the chimpanzee and humans and the present. And that's the development of the white of the eye, which provides a very strong social signal so that human infants know where their caregivers and their friends are looking and vice versa. Everyone can pay attention to what everyone else is paying attention to, so that we swim in this world of, lang of joint attention. And that scaffolds our learning. It means we pay attention in the same ways to the same things, therefore structuring a common interpretation of the world. 
It's very much a Vygotskyan perspective, and I don't think Tomasello's cooperative eye hypothesis could have come about unless Vygotsky's work had already arrived, as of course it did in the 70s or 80s. So we've got two very different perspectives. They are not at war with each other, and it's not the case that one is right and one is wrong. Please. Okay? They, are, they illustrate and pay attention to very different aspects of our environment based on different suites of concerns. Piaget's concerns are those of a very Western perspective, a very rationalist perspective. He's interested in how do we arrive at our abstract reasoning abilities from such a, uh, an oddly grounded, embodied, physical starting point, where we, where we live completely in the here and now and gradually acquire the abilities to think and reason. So he's concerned with this inner cognitive economy that's constantly changed and developing in predictable sequences. Vygotsky's perspective is very different. He's interested in what goes on between people and how the suite of interactions shape the person, how the person comes into being in a specific social and cultural context. So the physical environment, the social environment, the cultural environment, these are all part and parcel of the person, and the person could not be imagined without the, his or her embedding in such a web of meaning. Very, very different perspectives, both of them necessary. Okay, that's these two characters, and I wish we had more time to devote to them, because they are, of course, extremely influential. And the insights that come from their different agendas are of great importance to educators and to development of curriculums of various sort types. We do well to regard them as shining different lights on a very, very rich topic that doesn't admit of dumbing down. And this problem of dumbing down and assuming that things are simpler than they are is one we're going to face now with the next topic, which is innateness. We've met this before. Innateness has to do with what is provided by biology independently of culture or experience. Is it a good concept? I don't know. It's been a hotbed of a great deal of debate. You could see it as being more relevant to Piaget's concerns, who's dealing with predictable, biologically grounded sequencing of, st of stages. Um, but every sunflower, as it's growing, is influenced by its soil and by the, its nutrients, by the light, by its environment. So nothing happens in isolation from anything else. And innateness has been a hotly debated item um, as we go backwards and forwards from emphasizing rationalist concerns to emphasizing empiricist concerns. We've met this dimension many times now in this module already. And it's not either or, um, but what we're dealing with, on the one hand, as we adopt a rationalist perspective, we're looking at the role that we want to attribute to built-in concepts. And from an empiricist point of view, we're looking at the role of knowledge gained through experience and the grounding of the concepts in experience. Rationalist concerns emphasize reason and logic. Empiricist concerns emphasize the senses and activity. I don't want to dumb things down, but we meet this in a dumb way all the time. Those top two words, nature and nurture, are frequently used to illustrate this. Why do we deal with uh, the complex underpinnings of human behavior as if there were two inputs? It has to do with guilt. Let's imagine yourself, you're a parent. No, you're a judge. Let's make you be a judge. You're sitting there, and little Billy has done bad. Little Billy was caught burning down the church. Oh my God. Little Billy shouldn't have done that. And his parents are dragged up in court, and his parents are horrified. Now the judge has to sit there, and the parents are going, oh, it wasn't us. We did everything we could for our kid. He must have been born bad. And the judge is there looking skeptically at this, going, looks like dodgy parents to me. I don't know. It looks like dodgy parenting. Now you can see where the attribution of, you know, Billy behaved in a certain way. He didn't do so because of either nature or nurture. He didn't do so because he was born bad, and he didn't do so because his parents made him bad and were bad parents. That kind of simplistic division is, as you can quite clearly see from my little story here, a means of evading responsibility. It doesn't um, 
it doesn't approximate any reasonable understanding of the complexity of the num multiple factors that underlie human behavior. But that doesn't stop people looking for it, trying to develop these simple stories. And it's in the domain of twin studies that we find this emphasis on trying to apportion responsibility for either to either biology and innateness or to nurture and education and the parents and the society. A vain, hopeless quest. But if you believe that the world breaks apart in that fashion, then twin studies are obviously great for you. Even better is if you find twins who, sorry, were separated at birth and reared in different environments. And the holy grail here is to find identical twins separated at birth and reared in as different an environment as possible. Surely then we can say, ah, oh, that was nature and that was nurture. Well, extreme caution is required when addressing such concerns. I mean, obviously such studies are done all the time. Uh, frequently the argument is then dumbed down to attribute causes to one side or the other of what is a complex interaction. And I think the psychologist Vaughan Bell has put this best in this little quote. He says, nature versus nurture is a lie. Music is not melody versus rhythm. And wine is not grapes versus alcohol. And we are not our environment versus our genes. We are their sum, their product, and their expression. They dance together, and we are their performance, but neither is an adversary. I think that's a lovely way of putting it, and it reflects, it does justice to the complexity of the factors underlying our behavior and experience. The art of understanding this elegant ballet, he says, is complex and arcane, but you might never realize that from reading the quoted results of genetic studies. Genetic studies are ones which do this kind of thing, looking at identical twins, and then say, oh, okay, let's take uh, a propensity to losing your temper and come up with some kind of figure and say it's 25% heritable. We attribute 25% of it to the genes. And Vaughan Bell complains correctly that the extent to which a trait is heritable that is accounted for by genetics is usually expressed as a simple percentage which does no justice whatsoever to the complexity of the interaction between these. As he says, we are their dance, their performance. Genes have no meaning without an organism in an environment. They don't carry independent meaning. And there's no sense in which we can separate biology from culture or nature from nurture. That kind of simplistic separation is widespread, tends to occur very much in the popular press, and is pleased to be avoided. And this recognition of the way that these various factors are intertwined sits more comfortably within the Vygotskian perspective than a Piaget, Piagetian perspective. Piaget is very much divorcing the child from their context, I think. Anyway. Now we're going to come and look at a new topic. We're going to look at one particular research project, a fairly... Yeah, projection's not working. Okay. A fairly recent research project that came out of MIT. And it's called the Human Speech Home Project. Anybody ever heard of the Human Speech Home Project? No? The word Speech Home Project is, is a play on the Human Genome Project, which many of you will have heard of. And it's done by this chap here in the bottom right, Deb Roy, who follows a big line of luminaries, scientists who study their own children. Imagine doing that. Charles Darwin studied his own children. Sigmund Freud studied his own children. Piaget's work was mainly based on observations of his own children. He didn't really do experiments. And Deborah Roy's work is based on his firstborn son. The motivation for the Human Speech Home Project is not hard to understand. We've met a claim before when we were talking about language that we just kind of accepted. The claim was made by Chomsky. It's a very famous argument. It's called the argument of the poverty of the stimulus. And it goes like this. Children pick up language at a very early age very, very rapidly, and they acquire a competence that could not be attributable to imitating or simply learning from what they hear around them. Speech directed to infants, we've noted before, is notoriously weird. Ah, look at the little bop, it's got his mama's nose. It's not normal. Uh, it's not the kind of language of higher mathematics, anyway. Um, 
And yet all children develop language very, very quickly. Chomsky turned this observation into the, his justification for claiming there is such a thing as a universal grammar. That is an innateness, a readiness from bi on a biological basis to learn language such that you only have to pick up some details, the parameters that determine whether you're going to learn English or Chinese. And nobody ever thought to check. How do you study the linguistic environment of a child and check to see is the environment so useless as was suggested? That's the starting point for Deb Roy's human speech home study, which attempted to capture the entire linguistic environment of a child. That means every sound and word produced by the child and every sound and word heard by the child for a period of three years. Oh my God, how could you do that? That is ridiculously ambitious. He didn't get there. But in that time, the child is living at home, so he got about 90% of it because he rigged up his entire house. Every room had an overhead camera looking down on the room, recording all the activity in the room. There was microphones in every room recording all the sounds in the room, all feeding down to a huge army of servers in the basement that were recording unreal amounts of data. 200 gigabytes of data a day, 140,000 hours of video and audio data. What a job of annotation of data mining. This kind of project was absolutely unthinkable at a previous stage. And one of the benefits of this particular research project is to improve the way that we deal with this kind of insanely large data set. Here's an example of the view from one of the cameras looking down on the house. This is the kitchen, I think. Yep. Yeah. And you might immediately have concerns, uh, all kinds of concerns about this project. First of all, did the child consent to this? And there was a huge series of discussions, safeguards and so on put in place in order to ensure that um, nothing that could compromise the uh, personal freedom of the child was given away, made publicly available or what have you. Um, and every room had switches involved that you could delete the last 10 seconds or the last minute or so of what went on, because people are people and you need some privacy as well. So this is a massive surrendering of privacy in order to document the linguistic environment of a single child. What do you get if you do this? Well, you get a view of linguistic development quite unlike anything that you get from the armchair or from occasionally swinging by a crash or even from raising your own kid. You get a kind of data that we've never seen before. And here's an example of one which I think is very, very moving. This is simply every single utterance of the word water produced by this one child over a period from its moment of birth, from, from, not from his moment, from the birth of the word, when he first says the word in context, and he says it as gaga, um, and parents tend to know what their child is referring to, so we get all this. That's not unusual that a child would use a non-standard form, and eventually it becomes a standard form, so the child has mastered it and says water. And you can listen by going into this database and pulling out all these individual recordings and putting them back to back. You can actually hear the word. You can hear the growth of the word. Piaget would love this because it sounds very biological, as if the word was growing. Here's one child's development of, of the word water. It took him a while, right? And you can hear it coming through, and you can hear him backsliding and so on. What a remarkable way to view linguistic development. Nobody's ever seen this kind of thing before. So let's come back to that assumption of Chomsky's, a theoretically very important assumption, that the linguistic environment is a bit crap, to simplify. Well, one thing you can do, and that Deb did here, is um, a remarkable feat. And I have to explain a little bit 
how this is done. You just heard one word that was born on a particular day, the day the child first said gaga, in the presence of water, clearly meaning water. So that's the moment that word is born. And the word truck is born on a different day at a different time. What Deb was able to do on the basis of this uh, kind of data is for several hundred words, go in, find the moment that each word is born. Call that zero. And look at sentences that contain that word for the few months before and the few months after the birth of the word. Now, zero means a different thing for each word. It means So truck is born on a different day from water. But we can do this, and we can align all our data at the point at which the word is born. And we can look at the complexity of the sentences containing the word that's about to be born prior to and after its emergence. The complexity is measured in a very simple way. How long, on average, are the sentences that contain the word? If it's longer, it's more complex. And the graph there shows a remarkable thing. It shows that prior to the birth of a word, the environment prepares the child by simplifying sentences that contain that word. They get progressively simpler until the word is born, and then they go back to getting more complex. This is happening at different time scales for every single word entirely independently. Nobody could ever be conscious of this. It's just not on. But what you see here is that there is indeed a dance going on between the child and the environment, the caretakers. Everyone is involved in this. There's this sophisticated, complex process of mutual adaptation going on that's completely out of anybody's conscious control. I think Vygotsky, if Piaget would have liked the biological nature of the birth of the word, Vygotsky would love this because it kind of illustrates graphically the zone of proximal development that there is this, you might almost call it a conspiracy, it's a supportive, the support of the environment for the emerging and developing skills and abilities of the child. Very, very remarkable. So we're dealing here with data that nobody's ever had before. The work on analyzing this data is still going on because it's a huge data set. You can see here we've just we've heard audio samples. Here's an example of audio visual sampling. So you can look when the word ball appears, is there always a ball there? Where where does it happen? <laughs> That's the good thing about science. We don't make stuff up where possible. We need data, and this is an enormously rich, enormously ambitious data set. So the Human Speech Home Project is really important because it allows this direct observation of the linguistic environment of a child, something that had acquired an enormous amount of theoretical importance in Chomsky's claim. Um, but Chomsky's claim had been very simplistic. Basically, the environment of a child is crap for learning language. The poverty of the stimulus argument didn't go beyond that. But as we would expect when we delve into things with a little bit more data, more careful observation, the situation is nowhere near as simple as it might have appeared at first blush. Okay, we're going to wrap up there so we don't get too far ahead. We'll wrap up the topic of learning and development in the next lecture.